Hebrews chapter 9, again this morning. We've been in Hebrews 9 for a little time now, and uh, we're going to conclude uh, kind of this three-part, uh, I guess, mini-series that we looked at, Hebrews 9, 1 through 15, this morning. Uh, next week, I would like to preach a sermon, uh, given the season, I'd like to preach a sermon about the incarnation of Christ particularly from Isaiah next week. Um, and then we'll finish our year out with Pastor Caleb preaching a sermon um, for us on the last Sunday of this year. And then we'll hit Hebrews again next year. Uh, already started and began to kind of work through with Pastor Caleb next year's preaching calendar. And it, it looks like we're going to have another year in Hebrews. Um, there's still, it seems like we're, we're halfway, chapter nine, there's only like 13 chapters, but 10, 11, 12, 13, those are packed. And so we're going to spend some time working through those next year. And we should be able to finish the book of Hebrews by, <coughs> by the end of next year. So Hebrews chapter 9. I'm going to read all 15 verses so that we have a good uh, run up of this text this morning. Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was prepared, the first part in which was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tab tablets of the covenant. And above it were this cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things, we cannot now speak in detail. Now when these things had been thus prepared, the priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services. But into the second part, the high priest went on alone once a year. Not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. Concerned only with foods drinks and various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of reformation. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. That is not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all and having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Holy God, this is your holy word. The oldest of us here are but children in our understanding and our comprehension of who you are and the things you have revealed to us in your word. This gospel that we read is dear and precious to us, not only because it is good news, but because we, who it is dear to, we have understood the great bad news. We know who we are. We know 
our sinfulness. We are well aware of our depravity and our wretchedness. And so I'm asking this morning that your spirit would make this good news even sweeter to those who have been redeemed, to your people. Please use this sermon, this text, to make the good news even better to us today, that we might worship you. But for those here who hear this sermon, this text of scripture, who are not yet believers, not yet born again, maybe perhaps have not understood their depravity as they ought to, I pray that this good news, though it has notes of sweetness, would be a bitterness to them because they would know they do not have it yet, that it is not their possession and these promises are not theirs and that you would give them a new heart and a new mind and that today would be the day of their salvation. Holy Spirit, please speak to us through your word today. It is through Jesus Christ we pray these things. Amen. The Holy Mediator. Read 15 verses, 1 through 14. We've been looking at, really going to look at one verse today, verse 15. For you who have been a Christian, if you've been a Christian for some time, if you've spent time in God's word, you're a student of the word of God, almost everything I say today is going to be a review. It's not going to be new to you. I hope it's not new to you if you're in that state because it is the gospel. Um, But there are others, I am sure, who hear this, who perhaps they've heard it, but it will be new to them in a spiritual sense, in an internal sense. The Holy Spirit will use the gospel to grip the hearts and minds and to radically change you today. Um, So I hope that it is not, does not, the sermon does not come across as boring in any way, because I don't understand how a Christian can be bored with the gospel. It is the blessedness, the glory. It is why we live and why we have eternal life. And so if you say, well, I didn't learn anything particularly new today. May it be that you rejoiced greater today because of the gospel that you have been given by God's grace. This verse 15 is a fascinating verse. And I chose to preach one sermon on verse 15 because it is packed. It is loaded. Uh, It's first of all, we're going to need to take one verse today because there is a complex grammatical structure to verse 15 in the original language. And that's probably reflected if you you are following, I was reading from the new King James version this morning. If you were reading from another translation, you might've seen that words were all in different places and it was all a different structure. It's because in the, in the Greek language, this verse, it's all scattered. It's all over the place. In the Greek language, word order doesn't matter uh, as far as understanding meaning. And so Different translations try to untwist the grammatical kind of structures of this. So we're going to do that this morning. But the other thing that's interesting about this verse, if we were reading it, verse 15, the number, just the sheer number of significant biblical and theological words that are used. Did you notice that? He uses the word mediator, new covenant, redemption, called, inheritance, all of those words, which are all big gospel words that need definition, right? They need understanding. And they're all in one verse, one sentence that he uses here. So there's a lot here to unpack. And then the third reason I want to spend on one verse is that I just cannot get tired of the gospel. I just cannot get tired of the gold that, of the gospel that is buried in verses like this. And when I come across them, I just have to kind of mine it out and remind myself of each one of these particular theological implications of the gospel as it's related here, these words. So we're going to just spend our time really on one verse, and then I'm going to break that and say we're actually going to look at verse 14 in review. So most of the time one verse, but we are going to hit verse 14 as well this morning. He begins verse 15 this way. For this reason... He is the mediator for this reason. Now that's an interesting phrase and it can mean either something looking back or something looking forward in a context. Might say, for this reason, I wrote all these things. Or you might say, for this reason, I'm going to then say what I'm going to say. Most older scholars who study this text think it looks back. Most of the newer modern ones think it looks forward probably doesn't affect too much of the meaning, but I think they're probably both right. Uh, That it's a transition verse. He's summing up what he just said and then kind of also advancing the argument into the next next phrases, next things he's going to talk about. 
which is going to be about what a mediator does, one of the aspects of a mediator. We're going to focus really on the back today, how it sums up or how it concludes what the author has been saying in 1 through 14. So what have we been saying? 1 through 5, there is this old tabernacle that's no longer there, but there was this old tabernacle, physical, physical, Visible, physical tabernacle, and it was a literal holy tent with specific ordinances and furnishings in the Old Testament, and it was symbolic, but particularly the key of the Old Tabernacle was this heavy curtain that was in between the holy place and the holy, holy place. And that particularly was a symbolic concept. That concept was there is a separation. There is an inherent separation between man and God. And there needs to be some visible demonstration of that separation because of our sin. That we need a priest to go through the, the, the veil, the curtain. A mediator to bridge the gap, so to speak. And so we looked at this two weeks ago under the new covenant. The old curtain was torn down and replaced with Jesus Christ. And he's now the way into the holy presence of God. Verses 6 through 14, specifically, not only was there an old tabernacle and an old old curtain, but there was an old day of atonement. The use of animal imagery to preach the need for man to be reconciled to God. This is what the day of atonement was all about. He says it was a parable. And the punchline, if you will, of verses 1 through 14 is that Jesus secures our atonement through his own sacrificial death. Thus, he is able to to cleanse our conscience because if a parable was temporarily effective in instructing us concerning the atonement or the need for atonement for our sins and the way for atonement, through the death of bulls and goats and sheep and all that stuff, then how much more effective will the death of the eternal Son of God, Jesus Christ, be in securing our atonement to actually cleanse not just an outward outward cleansing, but the inward cleansing of our hearts, our conscience. So the application to the verses, to all this, that Jesus cleanses our conscience through his death is verse 15. For this reason, then this is the application of it. This is what we need to take home from it all. It's the gospel gold buried in this verse. But first, verse 14, we need to see something that I did not have time to look at last week. We focused our attention last week in verse 14 on that phrase, how much more can God cleanse your conscience? Right, that was the whole like, big point of the text. God can cleanse your conscience through Jesus Christ. But did you notice the Trinitarian work of God in there? I think it's fascinating we see this. And you see this all the time in the scripture. You see Father, Son, and Spirit actively involved in your salvation. All three. Notice it here in verse 14. The blood of Christ... The blood of Christ, how much, how much more than shall the blood of Christ, that's the Son of God, through the eternal Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, God the Spirit, offered without spot to God, that's God the Father, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Do you see that Son, Spirit, Father actively involved in redemption? God is a singular being consisting of three distinctive persons. And it is both both one and three, and three in one that actively works to cleanse your conscience. God is all for you. Atonement, then, which we looked at, is this holy and blessed work of reconciliation, one to the Father by the work of the Spirit, energized by the work of Jesus, energized by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's how redemption is accomplished. God the Father determines the atonement. It is he to whom we must be reconciled. God the Son accomplishes the atonement. It is by his work that we are reconciled. And it is God the Spirit who energizes the atonement. It is through the eternal Spirit that Jesus offers himself. 
So this Trinitarian thing, what's the big point of this? Is this just some um, weird uh, theological nerdy thing you keep bringing up with the Trinity? No, this is the encouragement of this. The, the author here, we could look at this and we could, we could misunderstand. We can think, oh, it's, they're, they're, different pers- they're different beings. No, they're one being, one God, three persons. Why that? Why actively involved? This is the encouragement, my brothers and sisters. All of God is for you. He's wholeheartedly given himself to this task of atonement. All of God was for you in creating you. We see that in the story of creation. The father declares, the son creates, the spirit hovers. All of God the, God was for you in, in the garden. Jesus, by the spirit, prays to the father. All of God is for you in the temptation the Father, the Spirit drove him to the wilderness. Jesus succumbs there. The Father is pleased. And all of God, his whole being, is for you in providing your atonement. The Father is active in declaring and receiving the sacrifice. Jesus is active in accomplishing the sacrifice. And he did it all because the Spirit of God was working powerfully in him and through him to do it. That should encourage you that you have a three-in-one God on your side. You have a three-in-one God, an immutable, infinite being who secures your atonement. Not just a man, but the God-man. Not just the God-man, but the Father of eternity. Not just the Father of eternity and the God-man, but the holy, infinite Spirit of God, the power of God, all working for your salvation. That's verse 14. That's the encouragement from there. But then he moves to verse 15, and we see this gospel declaration for this reason, because God is for you to cleanse your conscience, because he did everything to cleanse your conscience. For this reason, this is what we know. This is the truth. These are truths to hold on to. And really, you come up with three questions. What, how, and why? What then happens in atonement? What is the point of it? What is going on? How does it happen? And why me? Why, why does God do it for us? Why does God reconcile us? Why does God forgive us? Why does God give us redemption? That's really what, how you can divide verse 15 up into those three words. What, how, and why. What, for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant. The what is he is the mediator. Christ is the mediator. How? By means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant. Why? So that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. So I hope you can see that in your text, in your Bibles this morning. That's how we're going to divide it up. And really, I don't have a lot of profound things to say today. I just have a lot of clear things that I want to make sure that we understand today as we just work through each point in this text, in this verse. Let's look at the what first. What? Christ is the mediator of the new covenant. Now, the first thing I I suppose we need to understand is, what is a mediator? What is a mediator? Literally, a mediator is one who stands in the middle. That's what it means. One who stands in the middle. Now, if you are mediating on behalf of your children, usually what that means is that you're trying to say, okay, so, so why did you hit him? And they say, well, because they were a jerk. Okay. Why were you a jerk? I wasn't a jerk. He, he'd and you're trying to like get both sides of the story and you're standing in the middle and you're trying to mediate a solution. And then you come down to it. You say, well, I'm not sure exactly, but I think I figured out that you did something bad and you did something bad. So why don't you just come and shake about it or hug or whatever you do and, and make right. And that's how we generally think of a mediator. We might think of a mediator as an advocate, a lawyer. He stands between the judge and the criminal, right? And he kind of speaks for him. And all of those are in some sense are true. But the mediation of Christ as Christ is our mediator must be different. It must be different because we know since he is all knowing God, he's not trying to sort out what's wrong between the father and us. We know that's not the case. He knows what's wrong. And because he's also eternal God, a member of the Trinity, he's already on God's side, right? He's already on the right side. 
So it's not that he's trying to kind of run back and forth between the two disagreeing parties, trying to decide who's right and who's wrong here. He agrees with the Father on what is wrong. So what does it mean that he stands in the middle for us? Now, remember, to a Jew, this was synonymous with the high priest. What does it mean that he's high priest or that he's mediator for us? Think of it this way. Jesus, as fully man in the middle, he is able to stand and absorb our record of guilt before God. So we have a record of guilt. He stands there and he absorbs that fully. And being fully God, he's able to stand in the middle and fully absorb God's holy brilliance that would consume us because of our guilt. So he's where the holy brilliance and justice of God is absorbed, and he's where the full guilt of our sinfulness is absorbed in the middle. There is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He absorbs, he stands in the middle. Perhaps, though, a better phrase than even mediator for us to understand this could actually be um, meeting point. The meeting point. He's where the two sides meet. That is, because he is able to absorb our guilt fully, and because he's able to absorb God's holy brilliance and, and majesty fully, then Jesus is how we become dear to God and how God becomes near to us. So think of those two words, dear and near. In Jesus, we become beloved. In Jesus, we become accepted. In Jesus, we become beloved sons, well-pleasing. We are made dear because of Jesus. But not only are we made dear and God's still over here, but now we become, he becomes near to us in Jesus. You see, the son is the revelation of God. The nearness of God is Jesus. A point of important implication, dear Christian. God is not distant from you. Regardless of how you feel, regardless of how badly you sinned, regardless of how foolish and ignorant and distant you have become, so to speak, from him. Because our nearness to God is not based upon our performance for him. God's nearness to us is based on the person of Jesus Christ. And so if you are in Christ, you are a believer, you are, God is as near to you in this life as he can ever be, and nothing will push him away. You get that. You can't create space between you and God. Oh, you can intellectually and emotionally and, and spiritually do things that are distant, do things that are different. You can, you can sin, you can drive yourself away, but don't think for a minute that because of that, God has decided to abandon you. Because if you're in Christ, he's not going to abandon his son, Jesus Christ. He did that on the cross for us. And understand, dear Christian, you are dear to God because of Jesus Christ no matter what you do or don't do. Because God's love for you, the beloved sense he has for you, is not based upon you, your good or your bad. It is based on Jesus Christ. If we can just get that concept every day, right? (laughs) Because we forget it constantly. And we slip into that legalistic mode where we think, well, God must be nearer to me today because I read my Bible for an hour. And he must love me and not be nearly as disappointed in me because I didn't sin for like most of the day. If we can get in our 
thick skulls, and I say that pointing at myself, the, the nearness of God to me and the dearness of me to God is based only on Jesus Christ, who he is as the mediator. That's it. Now, that will change how you live, right? That will change what you think. I mean, that's glorious. That's what he is saying here when he says Christ is the mediator. But I want to notice two things about this that I think are very important. And one of them is the present tense verb, Christ is the mediator. You see, mediation was not just what Christ did on the cross, but this present tense verb has the idea of a continual ongoing action. He is now. He was at the cross, mediator. He is 2,000 years ago after the resurrection and the ascension when they're sitting here on earth in this terrible struggles as, as early Christians. And he is today. He is the mediator, meaning Christ today is mediating for you. He stands in the middle and he will never leave his position. He will never leave his place of mediation. He is the mediator for you. But then also Christ is the only mediator. Mediator is singular here singular, and that's instructive. He's not one of many, but the full and final mediator. He didn't come to continue what the priests started in the old tabernacle. He came to do a completely different mediation, a new one, a singular one, the only one. He's the only mediator. No matter how much someone tries, Mary, his earthly mother, is not a helpful mediator for Jesus or for you. Really good, saintly, dead people do not bring you near to God if you pray to them. Prophets, priests, and pastors or bishops cannot bring you near to God or make you any more dear to him. Jesus alone is your mediator. Jesus alone. A lot of people think that. I don't know why, but they must not know me very well. A lot of people think, well, if the pastor prays for me, if the pastor... (laughs) If the pastor, you know, if he talks to God on my behalf, God will listen to him. And, and that's just not true. He's the mediator of every believer, and he's the same mediator for every believer. And he's the only mediator for every believer. So Christ is your mediator, and he's your only mediator. Know that. But. That's not the only thing that this verse says. How? That's what Christ is mediator. How? How is Christ your mediator? Well, the text tells us, right? Through, by means of, or through death, for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant. Of course, this implies why we need the mediation, right? There's things called transgressions. They're sins. That's what separated us from God. That's why we're not dear to God and why he's not near to us in our natural state. Because of transgressions, sins. But Christ is the mediator through this act, this work he accomplished, this thing he did. In order for the miracle of mediation to take place between God and man, an appropriate payment must occur. Jesus had to do something to achieve this mediation. The translation reads that Christ's mediation is by means of death. Um, Other translations you might read may say, since death has occurred, or because death has taken place. Why the variety in that? Because it's one of those uh, grammatical things that could have many ways of saying it. And what it essentially is this. And and the most literal is this, death having happened, that's the like three words that 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 are in the text there, death having happened, that's how he's mediator. In order for this mediation to take place, death had to happen. Why? Why why is that necessary for, for God to stand, for Christ to stand in the middle? Well, let's take a quick, quick trip to the beginning of time. There was no mediator when God created people in the Garden of Eden. People were dear to him, and he was near to them. Nearer than we can even understand, and dearer than we can even fathom. A mutual enjoyment was envisioned 
in that state. But because of rebellion and sin, we, in our first parents, lifted ourselves up against God, turned ourselves, and cursed Him. This sin created an irrevocable barrier between God and man. There's a great dilemma in this. The great dilemma is this. How could a just and righteous God overlook such a disgusting barrier of sin? But on the other hand, how could a loving and good God keep man from him and keep this barrier there? How could both be true? How could God be both just and righteous, which the barrier is necessary for that, but how could God be good and loving when the barrier hinders that? It's the great dilemma. God had a plan. He would restore sinful man into a peaceful and joyful relationship with him by exchanging what we looked at last time, by exchanging this barrier with a different barrier by exchanging it with his son and by paying a death that would cover the penalty that erected that barrier, that would cover the sin that erected that barrier. Then people could enjoy God once again because their guiltiness would be covered and nothing would stand between them and God. That's the plan that God had. But a crime against infinite God, which is what this barrier created, a crime against infinite God requires an infinite judgment. And so, though though year after year, animals died to make that payment as substitutes for us because we didn't want to die to make that payment. And we couldn't because we weren't infinite either. It became very clear that this wasn't working that the gap wasn't being bridged by animal sacrifices. That they can't do that. But God's plan all along was that for a death to happen, a death to occur that would pay for all the infinite sins and pay the judgment of an infinite crime against an infinite God. Of course, the only way that could be is if an infinite sacrifice paid that infinite price, a substitute, a vicarious infinite being to die in such a way that this could be covered, the infinite judgment could be covered, the barrier could be solved, God could remain just and righteous and loving and good and there'd be no dilemma. Of course, the death that occurred for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant is the death of Jesus Christ. The only one who is both perfect God and man, or as verse 14 reads, the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, this eternal infinite spirit, offered himself without spot to God. He's the infinite judgment. He's the infinite payment. He's the infinite person. He's the eternal God. He's the perfect one. Thus he can be that infinite righteous judgment that we owe against an infinite righteous God. That's what he's saying. So a death had to occur. And verse 15, that death occurred. Now what's fascinating about this text to me is what he goes on and says there, two things about this death being emphasized. First, it brought redemption. He says in the text there, by means of death, that's Christ's death, for the redemption of the transgressions. So for the redemption, this word redemption is another one of those big Bible words that's important to understand. It simply means to purchase for freedom, to buy for freedom. That's what redemption means. The death of Christ thus buys us from the slavery of our own wretchedness and frees us to have this unhindered nearness to God this unhindered communion with God. We are redeemed to him. Understand that. Your redemption is a buying to, a purchasing to bring you near in fellowship and joy and peace. This is a redemption. 
So Jesus stands between us. He's the mediator. He stands between us and the Father and God to make us dear to God and to draw God near to to us, but he doesn't stand there empty-handed. He stands there, as it were, with his own blood as the means of propitiation, the means of drawing near. That's what he does. And these emblems, if you could say even to remind us, the nails in his hands, the hole in his side, these emblems are visible proof that a death occurred that was able to pay our payment in full. A death occurred to pay our payment in full. And it wasn't a sheep or a goat or a bull. It was the man, the God, Christ Jesus. So that first part, it brought redemption. It bought us to him and thus brought us to him. That's what it means there. Redemption for transgressions. Redemption for sin. But not just that it pays for sin, but it pays for all sin. Now, now where do we see that in the text? This, I think, is just very fascinating if you want to get in depth here. He says, for the redemption, that's the purchasing, his blood paid, his death paid for the redemption of the transgressions, that sins. Then he says this, under the first covenant. Did you ever wonder... Have you ever think this? Some people have asked me this before. Um, you know, is it, is it true that like in the Old Testament, they were forgiven by the animal sacrifices and then in the New Testament were forgiven by Jesus' sacrifice? Now, if you've ever thought that before, it's understandable because it's so much there, right? In the Old Testament, animal sacrifices. But that's just not correct. Have you ever wondered if there was a verse that clearly and explicitly said, just one verse that said, no, the death of Jesus Christ pays for the sins of people in the Old Testament. You ever wonder if there's a verse for that? Well, I want to tell you there is a verse for that. It's Hebrews 9.15. That's exactly what he says, right? So specifically, look at the text. What did the death of Jesus Christ pay for? Which transgressions? The transgressions under the first covenant. What's the first covenant? The Old Testament, right? The death of Jesus Christ, the author of Hebrews says, the death of Jesus Christ paid for the Old Testament sins, the Old Covenant sins. There's your verse, if you're ever looking for one, okay? That's how people were saved in the Old Testament right there, the death of Jesus Christ. That's what saves them. Under the first covenant, the death of Christ covered those sins, redeemed those people. This is interesting because it proves to us that Jesus Christ was not plan B. The animals didn't work out. Let's try this one, okay? It was always about Jesus' death. Everything was about Jesus' death. Every sacrifice, every bull, every lamb, every sheep was parabolic. It was pointing to Jesus' death. That's what it was doing. They were not saved in the Old Testament because they killed an animal. They were saved by faith in God who promised to provide himself a lamb. That's how they were saved. We are not saved by any kind of promises we make or any kind of sacrifices we can do. We are saved by God and believing in the promise that he would provide himself or has provided himself a lamb. (laughs) And himself is that lamb. It doesn't matter. Old New Testament people all meet in Jesus. That's why we're all one people of God. We meet in Jesus. Here's the point of it though. Since the death of Christ could bring redemption to those under the first covenant, even before the death of Christ happened, his death covers the sins. Okay, think about this logically. The death of Christ covered the sins before he ever died. Now that's kind of out of this world kind of thinking, right? Jesus' death died for sins before he ever died. Historically, in history, before he died. If that's the case, then can his death also not cover the sins that occurred after he died? If he could cover the sins by his death under the first covenant, then surely his death is all that is needed for the redemption of the sins under the new covenants. And if Jesus Christ in his death paid for the sins of David 
before David even knew Jesus' name, then cannot and will not the death of Jesus Christ provide full pardon for the sins that you will commit tomorrow and 10 years from now? In fact, in reality, all of the sins that we have committed were future tense regarding Jesus' historical death. Because it's not about us. Well, I, I did, did I repent enough? Did I pray enough? Did I confess the right words? It's the death of Jesus that saves us from our sins that brings us redemption. It's the death of Jesus that saved David. It's the death of Jesus that saves you. It is the death of Jesus alone that may save your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. It is the death of Jesus alone. If they saved, if it brought redemption of the first transgressions of the first covenant, surely it brings redemption for the transgressions of Matt Johnson tomorrow and this afternoon and in this moment when I'm probably thinking things I shouldn't. Surely he covers me. It's sufficient. It pays for all sin. What riches of kindness he lavished on us. His blood was the payment. His life was the cost. We stood beneath a debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many. But his mercy is more. More than your sins. Death of Christ. So we can say, praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more stronger than darkness. New every morning. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. But why? So what is Christ as mediator? How? Through the death to cover all the sins. Why? This is a purpose clause. And these are very important in Greek grammar. These purpose clauses give you very plainly. This is why. In bold words. So that, this is why he did it. Those who are called may receive the promise of the internal inheritance. Sometimes really good people do things. And they do things for some kind of normal recognition. You may, you, they, they may not always be obvious and maybe they don't, even know they're doing it for that reason, but when they don't get that recognition, they just don't feel right. But can you imagine the infinite God of the universe who gave his life for our sins for this purpose and it has nothing to do with him? It has everything to do with the called, for the called, for the eternal inheritance for them. He died for us. He mediates for us. The Bible is consistent in its description of believers. The word used here, the called. Why does he use the word the called? Why doesn't he say so that the believers, the, 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 the saved, the born again, all kinds of words, but the called, call leo, to call or to choose. We get another word from this. We find all through the scripture, eklektos, the elect, the called, the chosen. We also have another one, ekklesia, the called out group. You know, God likes to use the word called to describe his people. That's the church, by the way, the ecclesia, the called out group. He likes to use the word called because it does two things for us almost immediately, that word called. One, it supremely humbles us, right? He doesn't say, so that the hardworking, so that the really, really, one, ones who really, really hold tightly, the strong believers, so that the ones who, who give up everything and follow me, so that these people, they are the ones. No, it makes us in the passive sense and him in the active sense, so that the called, the ones that he has chosen, the called out, the church that he creates, it humbles us lowly. We are not those who have achieved any standing before God. Any standing of righteousness before God has been a gift of his calling. And that's it, a gift of grace. But doesn't it also simultaneously encourage? It humbles us and encourages us, but we're the called of God. God called me. I have no idea. And he must have called me. And many of you have used this phrase with me, and I agree wholeheartedly with you. We know, right? We know that God called us because we know that if he had not, we would have never 
called out to him. We know what's inside here. Unless God does a work, I would never do it. And we're the called of God. What a beautiful phrase to describe his people. It's also intentional to keep the focus of the text, not on what man may do, but on what God has done in a whole, the Trinitarian God has done. He's the called, he's the active, he's the empowerer, he's everything. It's a profound truth summed up by Jesus himself in John chapter six. I want to read that text because I think it's really the author of Hebrews is simply expressing John six, John six, verse 37. Jesus reads this. He says this. All that the father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out for I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the father who sent me that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up the last day. Verse 44, he says, no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up the last day. What words of assurance there of being the called of God. In that text in John, there's two things that he equates. He equates, first of all, the determine of God to choose souls for his resurrection, for his inheritance. But also, he then in verse 40, he equates believing unto the son with that same thing. He says, all that I call, will I will raise up. And then he says, all who believe on me, I will raise up. You know what he was saying? The called are the believers and the believers are the called. That's what he is saying there. Sinners are not chosen then because they believe, but they believe because they are chosen. And so the designation, the called, is emphasized all through the New Testament to describe the believer because the emphasis is always on the sovereign work, mercy, and grace of God that always goes first. Always goes first from start to finish. Why would Christ be our mediator, the meeting point between us and God? Why would he offer his precious life for our rebellious sin as sacrifice? Why would he give us his called ones, this atonement? Because he delights to give us an inheritance. He wants to give us an inheritance. The called of God receive the inheritance of God. What is the internal inheritance? Is it heaven? Certainly. Is it eternal life? Sure. Is it resurrected bodies? Yeah. Is it final justice? I hope so. This is the internal inheritance, yes. But these could all describe something of the believer's inheritance, but I don't believe that is the heartbeat of the eternal inheritance. I think there is a difference between what is the internal inheritance and what are the results or the benefits of the eternal inheritance. Those are all benefits of being an heir, but it's not actually the heart of what it means to be an heir of God, an inheritor and eternal. It's not the heart of it. What is the heart of it? Well, two clues from this text made me think through this. First of all, the new, ta- new covenant is the point of the whole verse. So he's talking about that inheritance we get when the new covenant takes place. He's talking about that inheritance under the new covenant. When does the new covenant take place? Or when is the new covenant inaugurated? It's initiated. The death of the, of the mediator, right? The death of the lamb. When Christ died, we have the new inheritance. Okay, that's the idea there. When Christ died, we have the new inheritance. Okay, the second thing we have to think of in this text is that he's speaking of something that believers have now. He's not talking about a future idea. He's, everything he's been talking about, the main clause of this verse is the ongoing mediation of Christ today. So he wouldn't be saying in this text, Christ is the mediator of the new covenant so that you can have the new inheritance someday. He's saying so that you have the new inheritance today. Imagine that I were a orphan on the streets being adopted. And you were going to adopt me. Thank you. Thank you for adopting me. 
You're going to take me in. You give me a warm bed, a nice room, clothes, healthy food. And if someone were to ask me years later, what's the best part about being adopted? What's the best part? I mean, you had a terrible life. What's the best part about it? I guarantee you I am not going to say, oh, spaghetti. Good spaghetti every Friday night. And oh, the Christmas gifts were wonderful. And I love, I love, you know, when we'd have these, you know, we'd, they'd take me to the movies. Those are all wonderful things that I might enjoy. But I guarantee you, when asked what's the best part of being adopted, is that I can say this, I have daddy. Have a dad. Have parents. That's what I have. I have the privilege of calling the one who has adopted me dad. And he has the joy of calling me son. That's what the inheritance, that's the heart of the eternal inheritance. And it means this, you, he did this. He died for you. He's the mediator. He, he stands there. Christ stands there as the heir of God, the eternal heir of God, so that you too can stand with him as the eternal heir of God. So that just as God, the father said to Jesus, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I know without a doubt in my mind, he says the same thing to Matt Johnson. You are my beloved son in you I am well pleased because I'm with Christ, my mediator. I I know that. And and to know that I, as, as Paul says in Romans, that I can cry out, the spirit within me can cry out along with the Holy Spirit, Abba, Father. And to know that he takes great delight in taking his enemies and making them sons, joint heirs with Christ. What does it mean to be a joint heir with Christ? That's what this is about. He's the mediator. He brings us the internal inheritance, joint heir with Christ. It doesn't mean that we become Christ in our essence. We don't become God or gods. It means that every privilege, every right, every joy that Jesus Christ, the eternal son has always enjoyed is ours. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies is ours in Christ. That's the hope of the eternal inheritance. That's the joy of the eternal inheritance. And yes, all those things become true because of it. I do have a home in heaven and I do have the the joy of eternity and eternal life and resurrection promise. And all these promised things are there, but they are not the hope. They are the result. They are the benefit. The joy is that I am a son of God. That's the joy. Don't you think that at times we, as humans, we get too focused on the benefits and not enough on the point? That you have it now? You don't have heaven yet. Oh, we know that. Your week may have felt like you had hell. We don't have heaven yet. But we have sonship today. You have the eternal inheritance because of Christ's death in the new covenant. This is the gospel. This is the joy. Christ, my mediator, has brought God near to me as my true father. And he, Christ, has made me dear to God as his true son. Through the death, so that I might forever enjoy, now and forever enjoy, this eternal inheritance. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to be called sons of God. Praise him for his glorious gospel.